one to 55 and five. The only show on YouTube that cares about the 1955 Parkhurst wrestling trading card set and who was in it. I'm Ian Riccoboni. I'm joined by Carrie Silk and Carrie. We're taking a walk down memory lane once again. We had an interesting one yesterday. George Gordienko. Uh, yeah, it was a name that you knew, but we didn't know much about him. I, after hearing about his history, I felt I should have known more, but I did know his name. And that's why I'm happy that when we do these ones where I'm sort of stumped and uh, through the magic of Twitter, some of these people that are more, who are, I don't consider myself a historian. I just know a lot of stuff. But guys like Pat Lepard, mm-hmm. guys like Matt Farmer, guys like Tim Hornbecker. Right. Um, uh, I don't know the man's name, but he's, he goes under the OST. Uh, and it, it, George Napolitano, too. Right. Uh, it, it, we need to find some of these uh People that know wrestling history, some people that are older, and it also helps if they're Canadian too. Sure. <laughs> yes, this is Greg set Oliver is another one. Absolutely. This set So was, please chip in, is what I'm. Please, because there are wrestlers in the set that wrestled primarily in Canada. We've featured A list wrestlers, Argentina Rocca, Vern Gagne, Bobo Brazil. And then we've had Steve McGill, who had a cup of coffee in Nebraska and somehow lucked into being in the set. Yeah, I mean, he, he went a year without a decision, and somehow he's, 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 he's in the set with all these great Hall of Fame wrestlers. So if you know anything, please leave some comments, give a thumbs up, check us out on Twitter. It's been really fun to go through a lot of these names, and we're already on episode 19. I can't believe it. Well, who do we got now? All right, so for the folks playing along at home, here's the deal. In my hand, I hold a safety net. This has information on the wrestlers. It's like Jeopardy, where Alex Trebek, he asks the questions, but I myself... I'm not necessarily knowing who these wrestlers are before I'm giving them to Carrie. Mm -hmm. Carrie's a wrestling historian. Carrie may know these wrestlers, and we're looking for personal anecdotes. We're looking for stories of Carrie maybe seeing them live, reading about them in the magazines. Carrie had a great story about seeing Tex McKenzie live. Saw Vern Gagne live. Will he have seen this next wrestler live? There is a possibility, albeit a small one, (laughs) that you've seen this next wrestler live. He's gone by many names. One of them makes him sound like a Dick Tracy villain. Uh, if you remember the great comic Dick Tracy <laughs> in the movie. I'm going to set the timer at five minutes. This is intended to be a five-minute history review of these wrestlers. So show this to the camera. I'll put it over the great Captain Lou Albano and Uncle Gunny, who are spiritual advisors on this project. <laughs> there you have it. Carrie, what can you tell me about Shoulders Newman? Oh, no. <laughs> Lou Shoulders Newman. <laughs> He looks like Dick Murdoch. He does. Kind of looks like Dick Murdoch mixed with Tony Deppin. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Um, Oh, damn. Uh, Would would it help uh, the masked Marvel? Well, there's been so many masked Marvels. Yeah. There's been so many masked Marvels. Canadian masked (laughs) Marvel. No. Okay. (laughs) All right. So... Lou Shoulders Newman wrestled from 1939 Shoulders. to 1964. Or 1967, excuse me. 39 to 67. Really? Uh, he also went by the name Lou Nyman. Lou Nyman. And you've asked the question a lot of times, did this wrestler wrestle in Madison Square Garden? Did he wrestle for Capital? Uh-oh. The answer for this one is yes, but it was under a different alias. It was under the Iron Russian. What year? 59 and 60. So, the Iron Russian, there was Iron Russian 1 and Iron Russian 2. And oh, I swear we have a post. There he is. Oh, there he is right there. Oh. Uh, Bearcat Wright taking on Killer Kowalski, Fort Guard Hall in Hartford, Connecticut. He did, uh, Golden Boy Arnie Skoland, Marvin Mercer taking on the Iron Russians, and that would be from the time period. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> So how about that? Shoulders Newman, one of the Iron Russians. He was he was looking me he was <laughs> looking right over my shoulder. Amazing. Shoulders Newman. So he starts out in 39. He goes west in 1940. Uh, we talked about Arizona a couple couple days ago. The, the original you know, I made the joke, the original AAA. This is our first wrestler that wrestled primarily in Kansas for a year. Well, Kansas was central states. Right. Um and I don't know if the years he was there. I mean, eventually 49. Bob, well, that was way, yeah. <laughs> way, way pre Bob Geigel. Right. So we need a Tim Hornbecker guy to 
tell us who was uh, running it, but it would be one of these old promoters like Al Heft or yeah. <laughs> one of these old timers. Bill Watts might know. <laughs> Leroy, well, maybe it was Leroy McGurk. Could be. Or might that it might have even been before his time. But go ahead, please. Yeah, it could be. Well, he uh, wrestled Maple Leaf Wrestling in uh, 1950 as the Mass Marvel. Uh, Fred Atkins was his tag team partner. That's a name I know. For, for quite a while. He lost the mask to one of the Zebra Kids, one of the many Zebra Kids. That's another name that kind of repeats itself over history. Uh, goes to Montreal, puts a mask back on. <laughs> and one of the I mean, you lose a mask in one place, you put it back on uh, for, for Pat Quinn in Montreal. Uh, Billy Darnell is the man that unmasks in there. He wins something called the NWA Los Angeles jackpot title <laughs> against the Zebra Kid in the 50s. Uh, teams with Han Sch- Hans Schnabel. Schnabel. Hans Schnabel. And Hans he, Schmidt. He has a lot of success with Hans Schnabel. So this is what's crazy about this, this Lou Newman. Uh, you know you know this man, Ricky Dozen. Sure. One of the great box office attractions, maybe the, the biggest drawing wrestler in the history of Japan, pulled that insane TV rating where like 95% of Japanese right, TV. Right, he and Freddie Blass, when Freddie Blassie went over there. Right. And allegedly... St- Seven or eight people had heart attacks watching TV from Freddie Blassie biting him. Right. And, and so in 1954, he teams with Hans Schnabel and he beats Ricky Dozen. He beats Konichi Endo in, in these big tag team matches. Of course, they win the first one. They lose like 30 in a row. <laughs> 30 rematches that were presumably probably not televised in any way. But uh, it becomes a pretty big draw in Japan. Becomes a, one of the recognized NWA tag team now, champions. Now, what year is that? 54. He must have been, because we referenced the Sharp, well, I don't know if we got Sharp to brothers. the Sharp Brothers. They're in the set, yeah. But um, I think that might that might be the beginning of when they were bringing American, you know, they had Amer- pro-American style wrestling, and yeah. they were bringing American wrestlers. Yeah. So he's certainly a groundbreaker. Certainly is. And he uh, regularly faces Al Mills in Calgary. Al Mills is a name that I kind of know, but maybe we'll get to in the set. I wonder if Al Mills is Tiny Mills. Maybe. that name we'll, I know. We'll check into that. And then goes to Capitol in 59 as an Iron Russian. Uh, and then uh, rides out his career in different places. Goes to Hawaii in 64. Uh, faces Antonio Inoki in 1966. So he's a guy that ends up having quite a bit of a career in different places. Specifically... In Japan, unassuming the Dick Murdoch and Tony Deppin's love love child here, <laughs> uh, Tony Deppin's more handsome, but amazing. I had no idea who this man was, and to come to find out, one of the recognized NWA World Tag Team Champions and a big time money maker with Ricky Dozen. And well, Endo. with that history, I'm open to get lambasted <laughs> by the other historians. Please chi- please chime in because. Uh, Obviously, this guy had quite a career. But this is the amazing part. This guy is this gentleman had, you know, with all due respect to current wrestlers, a career that a a current guy would die for. Right. And I've never heard Lou Newman's name mentioned once previous to that. So it's just incredible that he's just his poor guys floating in obscurity when he's one of the groundbreakers going over and fighting Ricky Dozen and Endo and tag action and then coming back and, and wrestling out the garden. So. Incredible. Fighting Antonio Noki in 66, one of his, you know, one of his breakthrough matches. <laughs> just incredible that somebody like that is, is just kind of lost to history. Very good stuff. Yeah. So Lou Newman, card number 20, maybe one of the weirder cards in the set. It just kind of looks like he's naked, but we'll ignore that <laughs> for now. Uh, this one's been fun, Carrie. I enjoyed researching Lou Newman. Very good. Let's, uh, so we're going to number 20 next. Lucky number 20 and boy. Do I have a name for you on number 20? I got it right here. It's a secret. I'm not telling Gary. So that's been episode number 19 of 55 and 5. If you want to binge these in audio form, check us out at adfreeshows.com. Conrad's been gracious to add us to the tier. We're also doing an exclusive video show over there where Last Stop Penn Station presents the poster of the week. You can hear more of Kerry and I on Last Stop Penn Station. Get that wherever you get your podcasts. I want to thank Carrie, Lamb Chop, AJ of Basan Creative and Web Design for presenting 55.5. I'm Ian Rickabotton. Happy wrestling, everybody.